Welcome to the presentation on Unit 26. We're going to visit a little bit about strengths of acids and bases. This is Chapter 7 material, in particular Section 7, four, five, six, and 7. Uh, an acid, we saw a little bit in the earlier unit, an acid is something that gives up a hydrogen ion. And what we're going to look at now is what we talk about, the strengths of acids and bases. <coughs> we'll visit a little bit about what we call neutralization reactions. Look at the pH scale, which you've certainly heard of at some point, And visit about the idea of conjugate acids and base pairs. Call it an acid reaction. This is the previous unit is written generally as this. I have an acid over here where H is a hydrogen ion and A is just anything else. So H is an H plus, A is an anion. Uh, it could have anything in it. We've seen different types of polyatomic anions it could be, or even single anions it could be. It reacts with water as a liquid in here, and what we end up with is the hydrogen ion is separates from the A anion, so I end up with the A anion floating around here. I end up with a hydronium ion, or the H tacked on here, it gives me an H3O with a plus charge on it over there. So it's a generic looking acid type of reaction that you see here. Any acid going, undergoing this reaction with water will, will undergo this reaction with water, but they'll do it to different extents. When we talk about a strong acid, what it means is if I took a hundred of these strong acid molecules and I dump it into water, I'd get a hundred of them going through this process. I get a hundred A ions, I get a hundred hydronium ions in your 99 or 98, some very, very significant number. That makes something a strong acid. A weak acid is one does not split up, does not react as much. And so I might start with an HA here, and 100 of these here for weak acid, goes through the process, and maybe only five hydronium ions show up, and five of the ions, A ions show up over on this side. That's a weak acid. How can we tell who's weak and strong? Well, telling who's weak and strong is a matter of pretty much knowing who's strong. There are seven strong acids, HCl, HBr, HI, nitric, sulfuric, chloric, and perchloric acid. Those are known as strong acids. You put them into water, they break up virtually 100%. You put them in other things, they may not do that, but water we're talking about here, they're going to break up 100%. Weak acids, then, are an easy list to know because if you know the seven strong acids, then everybody else we consider to be weak. Uh, examples of these, some famous ones, HF, hydrofluoric acid, HNO2. Uh, HC2HO3 is uh, acetic acid. Acetic acid is in vinegar. Uh, it gives that kind of that kind of uh, taste that you have inside of vinegar. And so, basically, any weak acid is one that's not one of the seven strong acids that we saw above. So, when I think about um, bases, now bases are the other guys. They're the ones who pick up a hydrogen ion solution, the bronsted lowry idea. If they pick up an a if they pick up a hydrogen ion solution, right? then they're going to be a base. I can pick that on up. A strong base, and we say here, a strong base is completely ionized in water. This is almost kind of backwards to that accepting hydrogen idea. And a weak base is only slightly ionized in water because you're not thinking about this thing breaking up. You're thinking about it taking on a hydrogen ion. So we think about the strong base is typically what the, if we go back and think about the Arrhenius idea of giving up hydroxides, it might be easier, is sodium hydroxide goes into water well. It splits up 100% into sodium ions hydroxide ions. So it's going to be a strong base. It ionizes completely in water. Uh, and it turns out the, the other alkali metals, the other ones in group 1, do the same thing. In group 2, it's only the heavier ones that tend to do this. So things like uh, calcium sometimes on the border, but strontium, uh, barium hydroxides, those are considered to be strong, break up 100%. The other ones up toward the top, beryllium hydroxide and even calcium hydroxide, have some solubility. They don't dissolve very well, so I don't get very many hydroxides out of them. But all the group ones are strong bases, and then pretty much strontium and barium from down below. And another example of weak bases, kind of weird one, is an example is ammonia, NH3. Ammonia reacts with water. You notice when ammonia reacts with water, he picks up an ammonium ion. That's the bronsted lowry idea. Generates hydroxide ions, okay, which is a Arrhenius idea over here. And this, these lopsided arrows here are in, here to indicate that it's not equal. He doesn't break up 100%. He kind of actually sides a lot toward the side where the ammonia is over in here. And so ammonia is a weak base because it goes through this process a little bit. If I put 100 ammonia molecules in the water, I may get a 5 or 6 of the ammonium ions over on the other side. So he's going to be a weak sort of a uh, base. So let's take a look at a simulation, see if we can get this weak and strong idea in our heads a little bit. So let me shift to that. Uh, more right there, and we'll go off to here. And again, I'll put this link out if you want to play with it on your own. So here's an example. I won't worry about the pH part yet. We're going to do that next. 
So I look in here, and here's an example of water molecules. And so I have a water molecule, I have a water molecule here, water molecule over here. When they react with each other, what will happen is a hydrogen ion can move from one water molecule to the other. So it leaves an OH behind here, which is what this is, and it forms the hydronium ion over here, the H3O with a plus in it. If you look at this with you know two samples, and it's not very exciting to look at. If I take and um, Put, we're going to put more molecules in. Oh, because I can't do it in this one. Maybe like something like that. So if I have water, I have this split between hydronium and hydroxide. If I throw the solvent, there you go. Throw the solvent molecules in, I'm good. Throw the solvent molecules in here see all the water molecules in here? So this many of them roughly break up out of that many. It's really a pretty tiny number of them that break up inside of there. Now, let's take a look at something like a strong acid. This would be like one of our seven strong acids, like an HCl or all. So and if I look at this guy in here, HA, over right here, so this is the H, the little tiny guy is the H, big gray one is the A, I, N, I, and here's my water molecule. So I'm going to give a hydrogen ion up to this to form hydronium ion, and I get the A ion left behind. Well, what happens inside here? When you look through here, what you see is virtually everybody <coughs> is either the hydronium ion, like this one, or the A ion, like this one over here. Okay? And I have a strong acid in here, strong acid in here, break up, they do this 100%, and so it looks like that. If I shift to weak acid now, you know, weak acid, here's what I have, is same looking reaction down here, but now what you'll see is you'll see lots of the HAs still together. Here's an HA, here's an HA, here's an HA, here's an HA. They did not break up. I see an occasional hydronium ion, an occasional A ion in here, but it's not a very big breakup. And so this is an example of a weak acid. If you turn around and look at bases inside of here, and this is a strong base, so I have my metal over here, and I have my hydroxide, my OH over here, and I put him into water, what happens is I get the metal and I get the hydroxide. I get the anion and the hydroxide. If I look at a weak base, like an ammonia or something, what I find out in here is the base, like ammonia, ends up very often and it's just as ammonia started with, just as the gray ball we started with here, reacts with water. I get a few of these hydroxides. I get a few of these BH plus ions. These are, these are BH pluses and then these are hydroxides, but they don't break up all the way. So. The idea of strong and weak is a matter of what's the degree to which you take care of, well, what's the degree to which you do this process or go through this process. And so let's take a look then back here and go on to the next page and look at something called neutralization. Actually, we have acids, we have bases. Well, acids and bases react with each other. As a matter of fact, any time an acid goes into a reaction, it's making something else be a base and vice versa. There's always an acid and always a base involved. You can't have one without the other. So if you look at these examples that I have in here, in this box on the left are all acids. HCl is a strong acid, H2SO4 is a strong acid, acetic acid is a weak acid. And here I've got bases. I've got sodium hydroxide is a strong base, potassium hydroxide is a strong base, barium hydroxide is a strong base. Those are all strong bases. On the other side what happens really is I take it and I swap partners. My plus, my hydrogen with a plus on it comes over and replaces the sodium over here. My sodium comes back over on this side and I end up with sodium chloride and water in the end. No matter whether the bases and acids are weak or strong, what's happening is I'm going through, I'm forming what we call a salt. It's sort of like a base without the hydroxide or an acid without the hydrogen ion. Got both those parts in it and I form water. That's a neutralization reaction. It actually does, it takes a neutralized solution, doesn't make it acidic or basic if you get it to the right point. Actually, in some cases, depending on whether it's weak or strong, it can end up being a little bit acidic, a little bit basic when you get done. But the idea is that the, the acid and base react to form a salt and water. <coughs> You've probably heard of the pH scale, so let's take a look at it just to see what this thing goes like. If you know anything at all about the pH scale, you probably know it runs from 0 to 14. Well, that being the case, it would be helpful to know something about what in the world that means in terms of all these hydrogen ion sorts of things we're looking at. So when we look at the pH scale, the one I have drawn out here in the middle of the page, right across here, this guy here, and the pH is down here, the bottom part, it runs from 0 up to 14. Actually, the scale can run down below 0, it can run above. There's nothing that keeps it from doing that, it's just we don't normally see those, so we don't worry about those types of levels. 
And so that's a nice little scale, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 14. At the top of it, I got the molarities. Remember molarity, number of moles of solute per liter of solution? Here's my 1 molar, 10 to the minus 1 molar, 10 to the minus 2 molar, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. And so what I'm looking at up here is, if you kind of just wanted to find a pattern, what would the pattern look like? When my pH is 6, my power is 10 to the minus 6. When my pH is 10, my power is 10 to the minus 10 that pH is telling you something about the power of 10 on that concentration. And notice that as you come across here, as you go from the left to the right, your concentration is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and your pH is going up and up and up. Okay, it's getting bigger and bigger. The idea of a power of 10 in a scale is not unheard of. If you think of the Richter scale for earthquakes, that's exactly what that is. An earthquake that has a, a magnitude of 7 is 10 times worse than one that has a magnitude of 6. Now, in the Richter scale, it goes the same direction. The worse the earthquake is, the higher the number goes. Here it goes opposite. The higher my concentration of hydrogen ion goes, the lower my pH goes, in this case. Think about a decibel scale, sound. I'm talk about decibels. Those are That's a factor of 10 scale, too. The more decibels, the louder it's going to be. The way we define the pH scale here as we say, the pH is a negative logarithm of the hydronium ion concentration, the LOG, the base 10 logarithm from way back in your previous math days. You've probably run into the logarithm. And all the hydro concentration of hydronium ion is, this is what the math, sorry, this is what the concentration of the hydronium ion, the molarity is, the hydronium ion concentration. Just some things that are helpful to notice, I think, is remember it's getting smaller as you go down here. And so as you go from 10 to minus 3 to 10 to minus 4, if I had a solution that had a concentration in between those two numbers, his pH is going to be 3 point something. He's going to match that that exponent up here, this 10 to minus 3, he's going to match that, but because of the minus sign we put in the pH definition, the pH here is 3. If I had something in here, the pH would be 3.2 or 3.5 or 3.6, somewhere along those lines. If I had something in here, between, uh, if I had pH between 9 and 10, then I know its concentration is between 10 to minus 9 and 10 to the minus 10. Those are helpful sorts of things to think about. All right, so let's go a little bit further on this. <coughs> and you can actually get a pretty easy idea. I think this is what I just went over. Yep, um, so this is pretty much the same kind of idea as talking about. So we can take a look again at another FET simulation, look at something about the acidity of different materials. And I'll show you something that is probably you know, helpful to know is this. Here's my simulation. Looks like this. And what this guy is going to tell me is, I have, uh, let's put an acid in to start with. Let's put, uh, uh, what do you think? Chicken soup. So we'll put chicken soup in here. So I'm going to drain some chicken soup into my container here. Boom. There's my chicken soup. Its pH is 5.8 up here. Here it says its pH is 5.8 because I just have it stuck into this plain old chicken soup. So it doesn't matter what volume of chicken soup I have the pH is still going to be 5.8. I'm not going to change the concentration just by taking more of it. One of the ways I can change the concentration is I can take and I can put more water in it and I'll dilute it. When we talk about solutions, we talk about diluting things, I'll make it less concentrated. So I can pull this handle up here and I can put water in. Think for a minute. Predict for me what you think will happen to the pH as I put more water into it. Go up, down, or stay the same. All right, let's see. Pull it in here. Put it back there. pH of this solution now is 6.13 pH of chicken soup itself is 5.8, so my pH got bigger as I put more water in. That's because my solution is becoming more dilute. My concentration of hydrogen ion is going down, and so my pH is going up. They go in opposite directions all the time. You can also look at a base uh, like this, hand soap. You know, that was a base, did you? Look at hand soap. Put some purple hand soap in here. And get that pH meter covered up right down here in a little green thing. You can move this around if you like. It's kind of whatever you want to do. pH is 10. And what's going to happen now if I put water into here? Okay. What's going to happen now if I put water into here? Well, let's see what happens. My pH actually goes down. Okay. And you're going to say, well, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense because how can my hydrogen ion concentration be getting more when I go down like that? And you think about the, uh, the idea of the pH is the negative logarithm of the concentration of hydrogen ion. Sure, my, you'd think my hydrogen ion has gone down, but it's like, look at the hydrogen ion hydroxide in the solution. They always produce the same number when you multiply them together. You know, 
what that means is as my hydroxide concentration is dropping down here because I'm making it more dilute, then I'm going to be more uh, become more acidic. Uh, my pH is going to actually drop. The pH of seven is neutral. I think I failed to mention that earlier. pH of seven is neutral. Less than seven is acidic, and greater than seven is going to be basic. Okay, so uh, that's not what, the one I wanted. I want this one here, right there. Okay. And the last thing I just want to mention is the idea of what we call conjugate acid and base pairs. You might think of trading a hydrogen ion off as being sort of like a ping pong match, where the hydrogen ion is like the ping pong ball. If one side of the table hits the ball the other side, then he's lost the hydrogen, the other guy's picked it up on the other side. And so in this case, when you think about acids and bases, whoever just hit the ball, gave up the ping pong ball, is the acid. He's donated a hydrogen ion. The one that's just accepted it is going to be the base. He's the one that's going to pick it up. And so when I look at some examples in here, the difference between an acid and the base form of something is in the acid form, I have this HCl, for example, when he gives up an H+. Plus, acts as an acid, gives up an H+, plus. what he's left with is chloride, which has a minus charge on it. This is the conjugate base of HCl. H2, all you have to do is take an H plus away from each thing over here on the left and get the thing on the right, and this is an acid, and that's the conjugate base. <coughs> They're called conjugate acid-base pairs. Okay, so down here, look at ammonium. I have an H4 of the plus. Well, how do I get to the base? Well, I take off an H, so it becomes NH3. Since I'm taking off an H plus, my plus goes away and up with ammonia itself. He's the conjugate base of the ammonium ion. And so the buffered solutions are very important to you because your bloodstream is full of buffering. Uh, if you think about all the junk you put into your body in a day, your blood pH has to be about 7.4 plus or minus a very small, small window, like a 500th or 10th of a pH unit, and it keeps that diligently in check. And if your pH balance gets off much at all, then you're in severe trouble because all your chemical reactions start running differently then at a different pH. So that is the end of Unit 26.